Welcome to Rockefeller's Barbershop. This is the day that the Lord has made, and I will be blessed and be glad in Him. Today I want to introduce myself. My name is Rico Rodriguez at Rockefeller's Barbershop here in San Antonio, Texas, 1733 Babcock Road. My phone number is 210-782-5188. Come out and get your haircut here at Rockefeller's Barbershop. You are listening to I Am Refocused Podcast on iHeartRadio. You are listening to I Am Refocused Podcast with your host, Shemaya Reed. This podcast is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. Now, let's tune in into today's podcast. This is I Am Refocus Podcast, and today is a special edition. As you guys know, we usually broadcast every Thursday at the barbershop. So shout out to Rockefeller's Barbershop, the owner, Rico Rodriguez. He is our main partner. So big shout out to him for being our partner. And quick down the list, I'm going to give a shout out to our sponsors, Miss Kim from um, River City Donuts. You can also... Check out Baby McClinton, All Sports Speed and Conditioning, and one of our newest sponsors, D.W. Brooks Funeral Home. So today we have a awesome guest. We have Miss Nicole DeSatimi. I practiced that like 10 times, so hopefully I got the last name right. Yes, it was perfect this time. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. So tell us about yourself. You're a book author. Tell us some of your uh, recent projects. So I, the first book I've published is a memoir. It's I published it as literary fiction, but it's definitely like a life story. Not my full life story, but a period in my life when I went through recovery. I was living in um, what they call a therapeutic community in New York City. Um, it's like a two-year program for rehab instead of just doing like, you know, six months or whatever. They put you through everything. So I did like upstate, which was like considered the boot camp part, and then went downstate and lived in reentry for a year and did everything, vocational, counseling, therapy, all of that stuff. So the book is highly reflective of that whole process and like all of the different relationships and things that happened during that time period. And, what, and uh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to ask you, what's some of the relationships that you built during that process? Well, that's the interesting thing. I actually ended up falling in love with my uh, substance abuse counselor, who is my fiance now till this day. And that was seven years ago. So <laughs> um, that was definitely an interesting experience. And uh, well, I formed a lot of friendships, too. But the unfortunate thing about being in a, a rehabilitation program is everyone's not going to make it. And I've um, witnessed overdoses. I've lost friends to the streets. Uh, um, I've witnessed friends who were getting better, who are no longer with us or who ended up uh, back prostituting or doing something that just um, was, was really hard to handle, a tragic ending of sorts. So um, it, it's really hard, actually. It's hard to be in that community because you do develop a lot of close relationships. And unfortunately, the percentage rate of people who do get better is so low that it, it kind of comes with the territory. So uh, it's a little bit tough. <laughs> and what were some of the things that, like, start in the process, take us in the process of how you get started from beginning to end with these people you meet? Well, I came from Florida to New York City because I was going blind in one eye from shooting a bad bag of heroin and I couldn't get any assistance in Florida so I ended up getting shipped to New York City from a detox I was in in Florida and uh, New York City welcomed me with open arms to help me and um, I ended up in the upstate part, the upstate portion, which was really interesting. Like I said, that was kind of like a boot camp phase. So you make a lot of friendships there as well, but it's a little bit different because it's structured as a community and they have the whole process where, you know, they kind of bring you down and then raise you up and um, you're really living in like a little community or commune. <laughs> and then, um, so you're spending like a year there. And then when you go to reentry, it's kind of like you're back in the real world or they're trying to acclimate you back to the real world. So you have no rules really left, but you're living in this place where you're still getting better and that's where things got kind of confusing for me i had a relapse um like i said there were some unfortunate tragic endings that happened while i was in rehab still living there um saw a very close friend and roommate who um left the program and she was like 22 at the time and she had left with like a 45 year old man and ended up getting prostituted and you know i had to pretty much say goodbye to that relationship so that one was really hard for me and just a lot of things like that and like i said i ended up um, 
falling in love with my substance abuse counselor, which I I don't mean to laugh about it, but it, it wasn't actually while I was in the program after we had ended up um, getting back in touch and things just kind of progressed from there. But that was confusing, too. Um, he's about 17 years older than me, and it, it was a really um, intense relationship and is. So that was something that I had to work through, too. And then on top of that, you're still trying to recover from the heroin addiction. And for me, uh, physically, you know, I, I was going blind. So it was it was a lot of stuff to handle all at once, honestly. In the substance abuse program, did they do a lot of group activities or are you just assign one on one with the person? In, well, in the upstate portion, there's tons. I mean, you have a full schedule. They It's like very militant where your full week, Monday through Sunday, it is a structured schedule with something happening every hour. You're given a job duty. You do counseling. You do one on one with your counselor, but you also do something called caseload. So everybody who has uh, who's assigned your counselor, you guys all meet as well and talk. And then they have specialized groups because most of the people have been through trauma, you know, who are drug addicts. Most I have. So um, they do like Survivors Anonymous and like um, loss and bereavement and women's groups and whatever we may need. They have these different specialized groups. So you're in a group with uh, about 15 to 20 people, say. And um, then they had something called encounter group, which they taught us to. It was called dropping a slip. What you do is you basically write down somebody who's upset. Somebody who's upset you throughout the week, but you're not allowed to confront them for seven days because they're trying to teach you to refrain and and be assertive and not so aggressive, I guess. So, um that was interesting too, because um, if somebody does something to upset you, you have to really work through that by yourself until that group happens, and then they seat you. So you, you're both face to face to each other, and you, each person gets a moment to say exactly how they feel, and you're you're allowed to express yourself as loudly or, or as. Uh, aggressively as you feel like you need to in that moment, but only verbally. And uh, that was interesting. So, um, yeah, we had a lot of different stuff that they were trying to train and teach us. They they believe it was behavioral. Um, It's a little bit different from NA, uh, the the, uh, therapeutic communities. It's more about cognitive uh, behaviors and, like, retraining your brain, as they like to call it. Mm -hmm. Now, tell us how, when you met your fiancé and... Tell us, set that scene when you first met met him. How, what exercise were you guys were doing, or was it just a meet? You know, going through your schedule. Paint that picture for us. So when I first got there, I was assigned to a counselor who they assign all the new people to. It was a woman, um, and you only stay with that counselor for about a month, and then they give you your actual counselor who's going to be the one while you're there for a year. Um, so I was put on his caseload, and uh, immediately he and I had had an intense connection, mainly because we were both artists, and we kind of connected on that level first. He had read some of my poetry, and I had saw some of his work, and you know, so we kind of connected on that level first, but... Um, really what happened with us more was we had so much in common in a traumatic way. We both had, um, we were on the same page immediately. It was like everything that I'd gone through or whatever pain I was feeling, I knew that he was on that exact same page. And it was very troubling for us because we didn't ever disrespect each other while I was actually in that program. We didn't. Um, it was very verbal and it was emotional and intense, but um, we never like crossed any kind of line there. Other, well, emotionally maybe, but not in any other way. And then when he left, um, he started working somewhere else, left that place of employment, and I was done with the program. We had ended up getting back in touch, and then so kind of for, progressed from there into something more romantic. Um, so it, it was a really interesting relationship from, like, day one, pretty much. And what sparked you to take that step to start writing the book? I was writing the book while I was there. Um, I knew uh, I've been writing since I was like six years old, like literally have poems from that time period. And um, so I I was writing my whole life and I knew I was going to write a a full book at some point. I just wanted a really good story to tell. I, I knew that I had to tell something that was like profound. And when I was in that program, it was there was like I said, there were so many human relationships and so many things that happened and so much 
trauma and so many people had stories to tell. So what I did I, while I was telling my own story was t- I was trying to tell each person's story who I had come across as well. So there's a lot of little stories tied into the main story. And then there's also the backdrop of a love story tied into all these other things. So it's psychological. It's romantic. It's a little bit erotic. Um, it's got a lot of different tones um, for a memoir. So um, it um, yeah, it's uh, it was very interesting to write, actually, because you have to kind of relive some trauma that you might not want to. But, mm-hmm. you know, you, you have to. It, it's my thing was like, I have to be real. Like, I can't I, I couldn't like a lot of memoirs. If you I don't know if you've read up, but like they have kind of that same story. The person's like in their low steps and then they go to rehab and they you know, they, everything's great. They have faced this huge dilemma of addiction, but then everything's fine. For me, it wasn't like that at all. I struggled the whole time. Um, even when, you know, I kept sobriety for long periods of time, I still emotionally was like dying. So for me, I, I wanted to be honest about it. Like, you know, recovery is really hard and you have to fight for it. It's not, it's not going to come easy. And if you really want to be happy, you have to work for it. I guess that was kind of my message. And like, you know, life, life is brutal and obtuse and it can be crazy, but it can also be really amazing. So I kind of wanted to bring those highs and lows in the book and let people feel them both, you know? If you now just tune in, we are talking to Nicole DeSatimi and she is talking about her book, we have people listening right now. They might be wondering, how are you feeling today? How How is Nicole today? How is Nicole today? Oh, well, I feel pretty good right now because I'm happy to be doing this interview. <laughs> and <laughs> so uh, I'm in a good mood today, definitely. But I will not lie. Every day is um, still up and down. You know, I fight for sanity every single day of my life and I think that when I wrote my book, I really wanted to get that message across. I didn't want to write something that was fake or I, I'm real. I'm a, I'm a real person and I, I tell truth. You know, I try to if, even if it's brutal, I try to be honest. So, um, yeah, every day is a struggle, but uh, I'm in a good place overall. I'm sure you're going to help a lot of people, not just with the book, but with this episode, because he says something about work in progress. And I think a lot of people they forget that part you know we're all a work in progress wherever your field is wherever your dreams are you know it's a work in progress it's like you're shaping you know it's like the marble and cutting all the extra stuff off so you can mm. see what's inside that thing so mm. yeah you know oh. it's great of of you it's, it's very unique i would say that you started writing in the process so while you were still going through you were still recording yourself so to speak speak to the point of someone who might be in that position that you were at that time what some words of wisdom and advice will you give that person oh uh, sorry i don't mean to get, i get emotional easy sometimes um so if if anybody's out there listening who um isn't in a bad place or feeling like they can't um can't do it and that they're just kind of ready to give up what I can say to you is um, I, I am the worst case. Uh, I uh, was a total mess and probably always will be to some extent. So if I could sober up and stop using heroin, believe me, you can do it, too. And that is not cliche. I mean it. But the thing is that you have to understand that you also have to work for it and you cannot victimize yourself. You have to get out of that mental state because that is the thing that will kill you the most. Wow. I know I'm going I'm to ask some random questions because that's kind of how the show flows, this conversation. What's some of the things you and your fiance do for fun to get away from all those, you know, sad stories, you know, back, you know, in the past? Well, that. I was telling you before, the cool thing about my fiance is, and I is, although we have a lot of years apart, we're like very similar people. We're both introverted, but um, we actually turned our our home into like a full on art studio. Every room is got some type of artistic element or something to do in it. And our living room, we turned into a little bit of a club at night, believe it or not. We, we call it a creative studio, but we actually have 
I mean, he has his DJ equipment. We have lights. We have LED lights that flash. You can actually dance in my living room. So that's something that we wow. love to do. Yeah, he, he he cooks and does the DJing stuff, and I dance and scream and sing. And it, there's lights, and it's really amazing. I wish I could. I wish I could show it right now. But it's uh, it's the coolest living room I've ever had, and it's very unconventional. But I don't care. I love it. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> art, art. And anyway, in any shape or form, we love to create and just let that, you know, that creative energy flow in whatever way it, it needs to in that moment. And speaking to uh, substance abuse, what's one thing that one should always hold on to while they're going through that process of recovery? Mm. The thing that a person needs to hold on to is really the themselves the core of themselves um you will feel like you're losing yourself when you start to sober up i I know i did and i know a lot of people relate to that um one of the reasons i used was i was like a rebel you know i didn't i hated society i hated convention i was in this huge rebellion against it but that was doing nothing but destroying me so it was very self-destructive and not productive for anyone especially not myself so um when you're going through sobriety and you start to sober up and, you know, you're changing and, you know, you're learning all these different like techniques and this behavioral stuff to kind of shape you into what they call a more productive person. Don't feel like you're losing yourself. And remember that there's a quote that my favorite author said, Anna Eisenin, and she said, create rather than destroy. And I love that because to me, that's like, you don't have to ruin yourself to be different or, you know, to show that you're not like stuck in some brainwashed societal you know thing where you feel uncomfortable and you just don't feel like yourself anymore so um you can hold on to yourself and still be healthy and still be productive for whatever whatever you feel is productive let yourself define it but don't feel like you have to self-destruct just to prove something to people when really that's just killing you you know it's not uniqueness it's death so Mm. you know (laughs) man how many books you got in there that's like five different titles right there. Yeah, I, I really like the theme of, of what you have been saying is a work in progress. I mean, yeah. you and your fiance having fun, you're creating moments and you're not you're not waiting for a moment. You're just, yo, let's Look just do it. it. We're going yeah. to create moments. We're going to have fun. We're going to live as if it's our last day. And exactly. too many people live their lives in a box to where... Yes they get to the point where they just explode because there's no more room to contain all that depression and misery and they leash you know they lash out but you didn't stay in that box you went to get help and you met someone that is something very special now so so tell us where can we find your book and give us the title you can actually find the it's called Addictarium, and it's at www.addictarium.com. I'll spell it because I know it's kind of a weird title. Um, it's www.addictarium.com. It's a, uh, addictarium.com. Awesome. And it's also it's on it's on Amazon too. So you know if you put in my my name Nicole Desatimi, it will come right up. So either way, you can get it. <laughs> awesome. And are you on social media as well? Yes, um, I'm on social. I'm on Twitter at author n d s e t t e m i. So it's author n d s satimi. But an easier way to find me probably would be Facebook at Addictarium, just the title of the book, nothing extra. Um, and on Instagram, I'm at Starving Artista underscore at the very end. Awesome. <laughs> so, awesome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so any last things you want to say? Uh, any future plans? Because uh, I know you're still doing some kind of writing or yeah, drawing or whatever, something everything um i'm right, working on my fifth poetry collection which is called mother nature and then uh, the subtitles earth bleeding tears that's one of three books 
three it's a three part anthology and then um as far as the memoirs go i'm writing actually a, a prequel to the to the addictarium um it's called narco terry and it's about the time upstate specifically so i'm working on both of those i also um, am now the editor of um starving artist magazine which just came out in january and um that is focuses around creative lifestyle um not just fine artists but anybody a musicians um fashion makeup all of that stuff anything creative we highlight people of all different creative professions and try to really support the indie artists so those are the things i'm working on right now <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome this was a great interview and before i close yeah. it i'm gonna keep asking one more thing um what's the number one thing you want out of life especially you know looking to the future plans and the future goals because you know the podcast i am refocus the concept is you know every day is a opportunity to live a better life you know we can make a choice to settle or we can make a choice to reevaluate and execute so what's some of the things you really want to see in the future that you want out of life I honestly, honestly speaking, more than professional goals, what I want from life essentially is a content. And however I have to get that, I'm willing to try every single day. I really just want peace of mind. And uh, if I can get that through the things that have been working so far, I'm happy with that. I'm not, I don't, I'm not really into physical reality and uh, like material stuff. So for me, it's just really more about what's around me. I love stuff that visually stimulates me though. I really do, you know, art, paintings, whatever it may be and music too. I love music. So, um, I just want to keep living and being happy and creating. And if I can affect or help anyone, that would be wonderful. And that's definitely an extra plus to, to the whole thing. So um, my plan is to just keep moving forward kind of with that, what's been working so far. Well, if you just now tune in, you need to rewind this tape or just press the previous button and go right back to the <laughs> beginning and check out this interview with Nicole D. Satimi. And she's a book author. Make sure you just just Google her. I'm sure you can find her on Amazon everywhere and everything will be in the description. So don't worry if you can't spell. She kind of spelled it. And if you <laughs> forgot it, it's OK. We have you covered in the description. So I just want to say thank you so much for this interview. And like I have been saying recently in the previous shows, people got to always remember sometimes your pain is somebody else's medicine. Yeah. So if you don't give up, you never know who's watching, who will be inspired by your story. So I want to thank you so much for being on I Am Refocus podcast show. Don't want to close the show without thanking our major partner, Rico Rodriguez, Rockefeller's Barbershop in San Antonio. He's been holding it down with us since day one. Also, Ms. Kim R uh, River City Donuts and Baby McClinton. He's been training people in the NFL, NBA, you name it. He's the guy for training. That's all sports, speed, and conditioning. And last but not least, one of our newest sponsors, D.W. Brooks Funeral Home. And like always, never want to close the podcast without saying, keep God first. Stay focused and peace.